Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is the first lecture on our unit on rules of inference. We're kicking things off with something called modus ponens, but before we get to that, I first want to briefly talk about what we're doing in this unit in general. So what is a rule of inference? Well, what we're going to be doing throughout this unit is starting with two or more inputs. These inputs are true, and we sometimes might refer to these inputs as premises. And then using rules of inference, we are going to output a new statement that must be true as a consequence of the premises. So you have true inputs, you apply rules of inference, and you get a new output that is also true. And so this rule of inference is going to be giving us a conclusion that did not exist before. This is in stark contrast with replacement rules. In the previous unit, when we were looking at replacement rules, all those replacement rules were doing was rewriting things that were already true into other things that are identical in terms of truth, but just with a different window dressing. So in rules of replacement, we're not actually learning anything new. We're just learning how to say things differently. With rules of inference, we're actually reaching conclusions that didn't exist before. So rules of inference actually tell us something new about the world that rules of replacement don't do. So to see this in example, let's get to modus ponens. Now, modus ponens is a Latin phrase. It's actually short for modus ponendo ponens, which is a mouthful, which is why we shorten it to modus ponens. But it's definitely cooler than the, what this actually translates to in English, which is the way that affirms by affirming. Yeah, that doesn't actually sound that exciting, but it's a little bit cooler once we actually apply it. So modus ponens works like this. You need two premises. One is P implies Q, and the other one is P. So you need an implication, and you need the antecedent of the implication to be true. And as always, just like with replacement rules, these sentences here could either be simple sentences or they could be compound expressions. Doesn't matter. As long as you have the implication being true and the antecedent being true, then you know that the consequence, consequent rather, must be true as a consequence. And those three dots there represent therefore. So you say premise one, P implies Q, premise two, P, therefore Q. So why does this work? Well, think about some examples here. So first, if I am Miley Cyrus, I am crazy. I am Miley Cyrus. Suppose those two things are true. It's clear that number one is true. And suppose, in fact, I was Miley Cyrus. Well, if I was Miley Cyrus and Miley Cyrus is crazy, then I must be crazy as a result. And you'll notice here that this form, these sentences on the right, is identical to the logical form on the left. So all we're doing is saying, hey, if the antecedent is true, and it's true that the antecedent implies the consequent, then the consequent must be true if the antecedent is true. So if I'm Miley Cyrus and Miley Cyrus is crazy, I must be crazy. Second example, if Lucy holds the football, Charlie Brown will miss. Lucy holds the football. So those are premises, and based off of those premises, we can conclude that Charlie Brown will miss. Because Lucy is holding the football, and whenever Lucy holds the football, Charlie Brown misses, we get that. And then lastly, as our third example, this might be the most easy one to or the easiest one to follow, just because this works in a geometric way, which I'll be showing in a second. If I am in California, I am in America. I am in California. Well, I'm actually not in California right now. I'm in New York. But suppose I were in California. It's true that if I am in California, I am in America. And if I am in California, I must be in America as a result. That's because California is entirely within the United States. So if you're inside of California, then you must be inside of the United States as well. And we can actually see this as a proof by picture. So this is how modus ponens works just by picture form. You can think of P as being California here and Q as being the United States. And just like this is actually an image lifted from our, our lecture on contraposition, just like before in that lecture on contraposition, if you're in P, just like that black dot there, if you're in California, and because P is entirely within Q, because California is entirely within the United States, if you're in P, if you're in California, you must be in America. So that's the proof by picture version of modus ponens, but we can also verify modus ponens and see how modus ponens works using truth tables. So here we have P, Q, and P implies Q. P was a premise, P implies Q was a premise, and Q was our conclusion. I'm going to highlight where P and P implies Q are true. Because remember, those are our premises, and we are knowing that they are true ahead of time because they're given to us as being true by virtue of the fact that they're premises. So notice that 
P is true in the top two rows. So true, true there, I've highlighted them there. And then on the right side, on the right column, P implies Q, that's true in three instances, the top row and the bottom two rows. And notice that the only place that P and P implies Q are true is in the top row. So if P is true and P implies Q is true, that means we must be in the top row. But if we must be in the top row, then we know something about Q. We know, namely, that Q must be true. And that's exactly what modus ponens tells us. It says that if P is true and P implies Q is true, if the implication is true and the antecedent is true, then the consequent must be true as well. And that's exactly what this truth table is recovering. So that's modus ponens for you. And in the next lecture, we'll see another similar rule of inference called modus tollens. Hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Take care.